Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video I'm going to show you this Sinpro 486 computer. And one of the things I really like about this computer is this little door here. And in particular the LED speed display and the turbo button beneath it. Now this video is sponsored by PCBWay, a full featured custom PCB prototype service. If you need PCB assembly, SMD stencil and flexible PCB manufacturing, PCBWay has got you covered. But now back to the task at hand with our Sinpro 486DX100. So the Sinpro was probably a desktop line from Syntha Computers a computer company from Antwerp in Belgium, quality tradition. And just above the yellow sticker you have this dark matte plastic that seems to cover an LED speed display as well as a reset and a turbo button. Now I'm a big sucker for these LED speed segments as well as the reset and the turbo button and the fact that it has this little door here just tops it off completely. And beneath this door we have this classic AT layout, CD-ROM drive, disk drive, nice little power button, reset, turbo button, key lock and of course the LED display. I think this is just super cool to have on a AT style system. This has three uh, digits which is also pretty cool. I'm also happy to see that the door, the mechanism to close or, or latch the door here is still intact so that still works. So let's look at the computer from the back starting with the power supply, you know your standard AT style power supply with power input, power out. Yeah, The, the case has seen better days but all in all it's in decent shape. Moving down, what we see here is the standard DIN style keyboard connector. So yeah, obviously an AT based system. Yeah, case needs some work. There are a couple of brackets missing here. As we move down, we see a video card. Due to the orientation of the VGA port, I am guessing PCI. Um, we also have a parallel port, serial port, another serial port and a game port as well as a sound card. So yeah, I just love the look and feel of these AT style mini tower cases. And yeah, really excited to see that this door still works. I had another PC, I think I had the big tower version of this where the mechanism just died. So let's open up the case and see what we have inside because I'm super excited to see what we have here. And I immediately see an AMD CPU and a cooler that has detached itself from the CPU. So yeah, this is a 486 based system, AMD DX4100. We have PCI slots. So yeah, a fairly modern 486 system. So here you can see the advanced micro devices or AMD CPU with the CPU cooler detached. On the power supply we have some specifications. So the Syntha Computers Synpro 486DX4100. We've got a Connor hard drive it seems. Here we have all of the characteristics of the drive. We have a coin cell battery so no issues with battery leakage. We have a PCI video card. I already see a Hercules logo, so we'll take a look at that in detail. And as you can see, the Sound Blaster card here, which is a Creative Sound Blaster AW64. Always nice to see a genuine Sound Blaster card in a PC. So yeah, let's take a quick look at what happened to the CPU here. So with these types of CPUs, you have this little plastic uh, bracket where the CPU kind of slots into uh, when you put it in the socket. And I already noticed that some clips broke off. So let's pull up this lever here and get the CPU out. So as you can see, it's, uh, it, it has this kind of plastic uh, little frame where you put the CPU in and then you can kind of clip the uh, CPU cooler into that little frame. But yeah, with the two brackets that have fallen off, uh, obviously it can't hold the CPU cooler in place anymore. So yeah, these two here have broken off, which is a bit unfortunate because, you know, these 486 coolers aren't that easy to find. 
perhaps we can fix it somehow so yeah as you can see here the kind of the little heat sink here should clip beneath these little two plastic uh, clips but as they are missing on the other side yeah it can't be held into place so yeah i have no idea what the condition this computer is in so i'm just going to detach the power supply from the motherboard get my multimeter out and see if i can get the power supply to start just by uh, hooking up uh, the hard drive, the disk drive, and the CD-ROM drive. I'm just going to hook up my probes here to the 5 volts and see if the computer will start. So let me just plug in a power cable because I don't want to, you know, risk damaging the motherboard if for some reason the power supply should be faulty. So let's just power it on. I see the CPU cooler uh, running. I don't hear the hard drive, but I am getting a 5.2 uh, volts reading on the multimeter which is a good thing power supply fan is running it's making a little bit of a noise so let me just flip the probes here to measure the 12 volts and here I'm only measuring 10.9 volts which is definitely on the low side but because there's no real load here the motherboard isn't attached perhaps you know that's the reason why it's it's dropping so low so yeah, I'm pretty confident now that the power supply won't blow anything up. Okay, so time to plug these two power cables back into the motherboard because I am fairly confident that the machine won't blow up when these two are attached. Obviously, you never know, but you know, things are looking uh, pretty good. So let me just plug them in. Sometimes they are really difficult to get in and out, these kind of old-style AT uh, power connectors, but... We got them in, so let's hook up the power again, start the computer and see what she does because we should get some beeps now as we have the motherboard uh, attached. So let me just plug in the 12 volt rail first because this was uh, fairly low. It was at around 10.9 volts, but let's power it on right now. And we get a clean 12 volts, which is good. I hear the hard drive spinning and I hear some beeps. So yeah, things are looking really, really good now. So I guess it's time to hook up a monitor now and um, actually see what, what what's installed, whether the hard drive still works and, and you know, how we can use this machine. Okay, so time to hook up a monitor and power the machine. And first thing I notice is that the LED speed display is not working, but the computer is starting. So that is fine. AMD 486DX4. Unfortunately, that LED speed display doesn't seem to be working, so we'll need to take a look at that. That's a bit unfortunate. Turbo LED also doesn't seem to work. So yeah, perhaps it's not hooked up, we'll, so we'll need to check that. But I'm already happy that the computer seems to be starting. So you know, here we have the AM486DX4 CPU detected at 100 megahertz. We have an SIS motherboard. There seems to be an issue with a floppy disk. So let me just go into the BIOS and see what kind of settings we have here. So yeah, CoinCell did do its work as all of the settings have been retained. I'm just going to disable the floppy disk for now. I didn't immediately find what was wrong with it. But yeah, pretty standard uh, award uh, BIOS, standard power management, PCI configuration, uh, the usual suspects. So let me just... Uh, go into the hard drive detection so it has a 500 megabyte hard drive seems to be detected fine let me just save and boot and see what kind of software is installed so let's just pause here for a second we can see that we have the AMD 486DX4 running at 100 megahertz we see that we have 256 kilobytes of cache on the motherboard we don't seem to have any serial ports on the computer which seems odd we do have one parallel port and there seems to be 24 megabytes of RAM installed. And it seems to uh, contain Windows 95 with Microsoft Internet Explorer. So let's just go ahead and boot Windows 95, but we do get a small interruption here because it seems that the UniVBE software or Universal Visa BIOS extensions is uh, telling us that we basically need to register our copy because it's over six months old, which I guess is true, as this is a machine from the 90s. 
you real we really should register it uh, otherwise we're using it illegally but i'm just going to continue now so that we can continue with the boot and after a while we're arriving at the windows 95 desktop with the microsoft keyboard and the microsoft mouse and the cd-rom drive and the usb ports and it detects our hercules dynamite 128 so we do need to reboot again but after that, it boots into Windows 95 just fine. We have the ACDC32 software. That has been a long time since I've seen that one. So yeah, really cool to see the Windows 95 desktop loaded. It actually loaded up pretty, pretty fast on this 486, so that's good. Has some basic programs installed. We have Adobe Acrobat. We have Chase Maze. Davy Address 7 Express, the Hercules Power Tools for the video card, Microsoft Works 4.0, some Sierra Sound Blaster AW64 stuff, some uh, routing software, and ACDC, which is the you know the the, the graphical viewer to, to view all kinds of image files. Not much of interest on the hard drive i don't really look at poking into these old hard drives but sometimes you know you do find this kind of old software or games that are hard to come by i'm not going to go into like uh, personal files or anything but you know the sierra folder was empty there was this moon demo uh, appears to be some kind of game that i still need to look at but other than that there was nothing of interest installed here on this 540 megabyte hard drive I did want to go into the device manager to see what kind of hardware was detected. So we have our AWS 64, which is kind of half installed. We have our CD-ROM drive, um, the video card, which is the Hercules Dynamite 128. All of that is detected, but I'm probably going to reinstall Windows 95 here in English version because this is the Dutch version and start off with a clean install. But I wanted to take a look at the internals of the machine. So I'm going to start by removing these little jumper cables here for the turbo switch, the turbo LED, the speaker, the reset button, and the power LED and the key lock. So let's take a look at the expansion cards that we have in this computer. Beginning from the bottom, we have the AW64 Creative Labs Sound Blaster card, model number CT4500, ISA. Next up, we have an IO controller card, also in a 16-bit ISA slot. Now the only cable which is connected here is the floppy drive cable. So the IDE connector on this particular card is disabled and not used because we do have onboard IDE for the hard drive on the motherboard. And then finally we have our lonely PCI card, which is the video card, the Dynamite 128 from Hercules with a Tang ET6000 chip. Just look at this Hercules logo here and the Dynamite 128 model marking. Really cool. And after having removed all of the connectors on the motherboard itself, we can very easily open up some screws here on the back. And then normally the motherboard should just pop right on out. So let's give this a little try here. It's a bit stuck. So take a little bit of wiggling, but eventually we get the motherboard out so that we can take a closer look. Okay, so time to take a look at the motherboard. And I really like these PCI-based 486 socket 3 motherboards. I mean, equipped with a DX4100 and you've got one hell of a machine here. Now, besides the model 486 SPI, I didn't find a whole lot of information on the motherboard online. I did found this reference sheet here explaining all of the jumpers, but on the silk screen of the motherboard, everything is also very well explained. There was also a sticker here on this ISA slot, but that also didn't yield a lot of results. But via this 486 SPI uh, model, I did find some additional information. 
Now, here in the socket 3, we have our AMD 486DX4100, a very capable CPU. 100 megahertz not being the top speed that you can have on a socket 3 uh, system but definitely up there in terms of performance and a really nice cpu to have this motherboard uses an sis chipset the 85c 496 from 1994 so this is the north bridge responsible for stuff like uh, memory pci bridge edi controller everything that they refer to as the fast machine now the south bridge, which is the 85C497, is responsible for the slow machine, meaning the ISA bus and all of the other I.O. functions. But yeah, as we saw earlier, a nice feature of this motherboard is the three PCI slots that we have here. So we not only have 16-bit ISA, but we also have PCI slots for stuff like video cards and networking cards. We do have five 16-bit ISA slots for the more legacy cards. We have a nice little 486 Award BIOS, copyright 1984 to 1998. We have the coin cell battery, so no issues with battery leakage here, which is good. Standard DIN style AT uh, keyboard connector. We have the standard 80 style power connector and this is one of those uh, you know early 486 motherboards that actually had ide connectors on board no floppy drive connectors but two ide channels so that's really nice four sim modules 72 pins are installed here so we have i think 24 megabytes in total that we'll take a look at we have a lot of jumpers here on the motherboard and you know configuring cpus on these old motherboards was quite the challenge but luckily everything is well documented here on the motherboard itself as well as some documentation that you can find online but you can configure stuff like the cpu clock you can set the voltage of the cpu you can set the cpu type as well so there's quite a cryptic um, yeah deciphering that you need to do here in order to identify the correct cpu but this is just a standard 486 dx4 in this case so there are a couple of jumpers that we need to set a little bit all over the place but you know if you follow the manual and the instructions you should be fine another thing is the cache that we have on board here so we have four spare um, cache slots here i think this one has a total of 256 kilobyte of external cache and here we have the cpu which is the amd 486 dx4 100 that we already covered on this channel a bit advanced micro devices so this is the internal product code it's the 100 nv8t uh, manufactured in 1995 week 6 running at 3 volts Requires a heatsink and a fan, so we have this little plastic clip here with two clips that unfortunately broke off where normally we could attach, you know, one of these 486 CPU coolers like this one, which is attached to a very small heatsink. It's a little bit dirty, so we'll obviously need to clean this one as well. Operates at 12 volts, but because we've lost these two clips here on the side, it doesn't really provide the best heat dissipation that is required for this cpu regarding memory so we have two four megabyte sticks two identical four megabyte sticks and then we have two different uh, sticks i think uh, both of them uh, the bottom two here are eight megabytes so we have eight plus eight plus eight giving this a total of 24 megabytes of ram the video card, which is the Dynamite 128 from Hercules with the Tseng ET6000 Labs. Now, you know, this is one of those periods where, you know, I think it's around 1996, 1997, where 3D acceleration uh, actually became a thing. So this, this type of card was obviously no match for 3D accelerators like the Voodoo or the Riva. At that point, Tseng Labs wasn't really known for its more performant uh, video cards. So yeah, it's a pretty standard video card. 
The I.O. controller that we have here is one from Easy Tech, where only the floppy drive connector will be used because the IDE connector for the hard drives is provided by the motherboard. So again, lots of jumpers here to enable, disable um, certain aspects of this card. We have a Connor 500 megabyte IDE hard drive. Now you don't see these Connors all that much. You typically see a lot of, you know, Seagate and Western Digital. A lot of the older PCs carry these Connor hard drives, these really old Connor hard drives, like uh, 30, 40 megabytes. So it's nice to see a 500 megabyte uh, Connor uh, hard drive as well. Now there is one more thing that I wanted to tackle in this video and that is the LED uh, speed display, the three digit display which is on this computer which is not working so we need to figure out why. Now in my 386 Dream Machine video, which is this 386 right here, I noticed that it also had a three digit LED speed display and in fact it was the exact same model as the one which is found here on this 486DX4. So you get the three digits, you also get the three decimal points, so you can make stuff like 4.77 or 7.44, something like that, all the way up to 300, 450, whatever you want. And there's this little PCB here, which again, in my 386 machine, it's also the S802. And this allowed me to find where the power connector should be hooked up, which is this one here. So the bottom two pins on this little PCB are used to provide power to the PCB. And on top of that, we have the reset switch, which is used to toggle the display from, you know, turbo speed to non-turbo speed. Obviously, that doesn't really do uh, anything um, special. It just toggles the two modes on the PCB, depending on how the switch is pressed. So yeah, if you want to rewatch my 386 uh, Dream Machine, I'll put a card here. So uh, it's a pretty nice, uh, pretty nice machine. But let's take a quick look at this, um, you know, cable that's coming from the power switch and see how this is hooked up. Because what basically happens is you have this uh, three pin um, connector here with a central pin, which is kind of a ground pin. So I'm just going to use my multimeter and see where actually we have continuity. And what you will find is that, let me just get this uh, right here. It's pretty tricky because the cable is very short. And what you will see is that when I push the turbo button, these two pins uh, make contact. If I release it, uh, there's no continuity anymore. And this basically acts as kind of an input switch to this uh, little LED speed display to toggle between uh, turbo and non-turbo. You can obviously also use the other two pins and then it will just work the other way around, meaning that you, know, you will have continuity when it is depressed and you won't have continuity when it is pressed. So just basically inverting the logic. And the power provided to this PCB is just this little two wire, uh, you know, jumper cable here, which has the red lead and the black lead. And when the PC is turned on, it just uh, provides five volts to the PCB in order to turn the relevant uh, LED display on. Now, if you don't want to blow up your LED speed display, it's always interesting to have like an external power supply where you can perhaps also limit the current and then just basically test by applying five volts to the correct pins on your PCB. So that's what I'm going to be doing here. So here I have my LED segment. We have lots of jumpers to configure the various speeds. But now that I know how to hook up the power, we're going to start with that. So the ground pin here was the bottom right pin. So we'll hook that one up. And then the five volts here goes right beside it. And that should already light up the display. Now what we're seeing here is that we're actually turning on the display right now in an invalid configuration because we haven't enabled the non turbo mode or the turbo mode because you know these are the three pins on top of that so we need to jumper uh, two pins 
and if we jumper these two pins here on the right, you will see that it actually displays the correct non-turbo speed. In this case, it's set to 28. And if we flip that jumper onto the other side, which is basically what the turbo switch is doing, it will uh, light up the turbo speed, which is 100 megahertz. So yeah, here we have it, our Syntha Computer 486DX4100 with a working LED display. The machine is starting. Um, I do need to reinstall it, see if I can run some benchmarks, some games, try to find a nice looking matching monitor because obviously this LCD isn't the most perfect fit for a computer like this, but for shooting video and for working with it it's it's sufficient but yeah that's what we're going to be tackling in the next video just doing a clean install you know finding a nice little monitor perhaps like this one which you know uh, is a little bit more um, period correct see how the system behaves with different video cards so yeah really looking forward to that so in the meantime, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribe to the channel if you're into this type of content. You can always drop a comment in the comment section below. And I really hope to see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.